Turning now to a story about memory, how knowledge of the past is produced and kept hidden in a place where history and its narration is highly contested, Israel and Palestine. For years, material that could reveal details about Israel's treatment of Palestinians has been sealed inside the country's state and military archives. Under the pretext of security or privacy, more than 98% of those documents are classified. They're under lock and key. It's a form of censorship that has been criticized not just by Palestinians, but by the former chief archivist of Israel itself. Historians and journalists say the policy of censoring material in the archives exposes the deep insecurity Israel has about its past, with archivists acting as the gatekeepers of history. For Palestinians, it's part of a wider trend of cultural erasure and historical denial that, beginning before 1948, has gone hand in hand with the regular theft and appropriation of not just their land, but their story. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the silencing of Palestinian history in Israel's archives. For Palestinians, displaced, dispersed, occupied, narrating the past is a constant struggle, which is by design, because sealed in Israel's archives and libraries are hidden Palestinian stories, entire chapters of history that were looted from Palestinian institutions and homes. After the Palestinian people were expelled from their homes, Israeli forces came in and quite methodically proceeded to seize all of the contents in their houses. It was done in such a way that to this day, we don't have a complete idea of what items were taken. Documents are scattered in so many places, some in the Israeli archives in Jerusalem, some at the National Library, Many of these boxes haven't been catalogued to this day. There is often no possibility for a researcher to have access to them. All of the archives in Israel are really um, very much founded on the erasure of Palestinians. Every single Israeli attack on Palestinians has usually targeted an archive. This happened in 1948 en masse. And also in 1982, when the Israelis invaded Lebanon and targeted the Institute of Palestine Studies, one of the reasons that they're threatening is because they're really a record of Palestinian social life and Palestine more broadly. There are important items like the personal papers of Palestinian leaders and intellectuals, like Khalil Sakakini's library in Jerusalem considered one of the most important Palestinian private libraries. Then you have Palestinian lawyers whose entire offices and files were seized. To this day, if you go to the archives, you'll find there's a Palestinian lawyers category, which I find strange. Palestinian lawyers, these are very private documents. The fact that they have been taken away is a sign of contempt for Palestinian history. It's an attempt to suggest Palestinians have no history, no documents, no belongings. Israel's archive law says that anyone can access the state archives. The most sensitive material can be censored for up to 70 years. But in practice, the state can and has restricted indefinitely anything it decides is damaging to its national security. Israeli historian Rana Sela has spent 20 years trawling the archives, uncovering troves of previously unseen footage and photographs seized as far back as the 1930s. Can't you hear the, call of In 2017, she made a film about lost Palestinian histories called Looted and Hidden. Over the years, Sela has found historical material that has been sealed for decades. In Israel's military archives, she discovered films from the era of Palestinian revolutionary cinema and photos shot by one of the founders of Palestinian photojournalism, Khalil Rassas. Sela also uncovered aerial photos taken by the Jewish militia, the Haganah, of Palestinian villages before they were destroyed and repopulated in 1948. The Haganah decided to photograph all the Palestinian villages from the air. 
This material would later be used for the conquest and rule of these places and their people. However, when we look at the photos with the historic perspective we have today, their meaning can flip, so to speak, and they can reveal the history of those who were conquered. Someone once asked me if I wasn't concerned that these materials might be closed off after I'd asked them to be opened. And indeed, the material has been reclassified. When I went back to the archive a few years later, I was told the photos do not exist. It's not just that material is censored, hidden from the outside world. Once inside the archive, its origin is erased, reinterpreted to fit a different narrative. When I started working with material from the archive, I saw photos with comments and notes written on them by the censors and archivists. For example, Palestinians are described as terrorists, as gangs. Seeing all of that taught me about how the materials go through a process of rewriting to aid or benefit the Zionist narrative. So the colonial apparatus that starts with the plunder and looting continues with colonial control and management. The role the archives play in reshaping history is under the control of political masters. Israel's military archive is managed by the Defense Ministry, its state archive by the Prime Minister's office. Before stepping down this year, Israel's most senior archivist, Yaakov Lozvik, criticized not only that lack of independence, but also the state's tendency to censor material under the guise of security. Lozvik declined to be interviewed for this piece, but in a revealing report summing up his term as chief archivist, he wrote, the vast majority of material is sealed and will never be opened. According to the Israeli NGO, Akivot, of the 14.8 million files held by Israel's state and military archives, less than 2% are accessible to the public. That includes restricted material that could expose Israelis to uncomfortable truths about their history, like war crimes perpetrated against Palestinians. Israel is terrified of the contents of its own archives and doesn't want its history to be exposed. Take one of the most important examples of censored material, the Kafar Qasim massacre in 1956. Many scholars argue that Israel used the Kafar Qasim massacre to force those Palestinians who had stayed on their land to flee. I believe there were direct orders from the government for the massacre to take place. So as long as the state keeps censoring these documents, it means it's trying to hide the past, to prevent it from being part of the present and the future. Who is allowed to remember and who is made to forget is an expression of power. Erasing the archival record denies Palestinians the right to narrate their past and to connect it to their present. But Israel does not have a monopoly over history. In the occupied West Bank, a major project is underway by the Palestine Museum to collect and digitize hundreds of thousands of items of historical significance. In the face of continuing historical denial, Palestinians are finding other ways to preserve collective memory. Archival fever, or this attempt to really record and collate um, these histories and stories, has been from the very beginning a part of the Palestinian struggle for memory and to a certain extent for liberation. There is no single authoritative Palestinian archive that may be a blessing in disguise because the more voices and the more multiplicity we have, I think. All of those things are sources of richness, not poverty. I don't think that Palestinian history should be deprived of documents and evidence. It is important to return the material to the owners so that it won't be me, someone with privilege and access, who writes the Palestinians' history, but rather Palestinian researchers themselves. Israeli society must learn to respect, acknowledge and understand Palestinian society and its history because without that, there's no future for this place.